Welcome to Christ Church Deer Park. Thank you for joining us today as we continue to worship together in these strange and interesting times. Wednesday is Canada Day, and there will be a very different feel to this year's celebrations. But I hope that you will find ways to celebrate the gift of having this country as your home. Right now, all around us is news of reopenings. The Roman Catholic Church and Evangelical Churches have returned to worship. Children are in daycare. Restaurant patios are opened for the long-awaited summer dates. And every head in the country is getting a haircut. Life is slowly leaving hibernation. Yet, here we are still in church lockdown. Of course, that is frustrating as we long to be in our lovely space, long to be together, long to attend the weddings and funerals of our loved ones, and painfully long to receive the Eucharist. But we must wait. Our church is taking a cautious approach to reopening in the best interest of our members, most of whom are in a vulnerable demographic. The House of Bishops in Ontario have clearly stated that our churches will not be reopening for in-person worship until at least September. They continue, this decision was made in consultation with public health experts with the well-being and safety of our parishioners and the communities we serve uppermost in our minds and hearts. So friends, we are together for several more weeks online. Let us make the most of it, because God can be worshipped from any place and at any time. Tune into this service while you're at the cottage and join us for Zoom coffee hour each Sunday. Wherever we are, together we are the church. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us through your Son that love fulfills the law. May we love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind and all our strength. And may we love our neighbors as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. 
That means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time. Remember, you've been raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. So, since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we can live any old way we want? Since we're free in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. But offer yourself to the ways of God and the freedom never quits. All your lives you've let sin tell you what to do, but thank God you've started listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had. And how much different is it now as you live in God's freedom, your lives healed and expansive in holiness? As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? What did you get out of it? Nothing you're proud of now. Where did it get you? A dead end. But now that you've found you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do and have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise! A whole, healed, put-together life right now with more and more life on the way. Work hard for sin your whole life and your pension is death. But God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our Master. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. There was an ad in the 1990s for Lotto 649 that went something like this. Imagine the freedom to do what you want to do. Imagine the freedom. And along with that jingle went a couple sailing off into the sunset on their glorious yacht or a family cruising across a sparkling lake in a giant powerboat. Imagine the freedom. And across this land, you could practically hear folks at home drooling as they watched these ads and then raced out to their lo local convenience store to buy a Lotterio ticket, betting that one day they too could enjoy that kind of freedom. And today we see the same kinds of offers of freedom around, and they look unique to each one of us. For some of us, we may think that lottery ad looks pretty good and how that would make us feel free, lighter in some way, unburdened by our cares and responsibilities. For others of us, Freedom could look like the ability to make my own choices and to be free to do what I want to do when I want it. The freedom to have unbridled agency or something like the Charter of Rights of, and Freedoms in Canada or life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as the US Declaration of Independence puts it in the United States. And none of those aspects in and of themselves, those aspects of freedom are bad they can be all good things. But none of them, either on their own or altogether, add up to the kind of freedom that Paul offers us today in his letter to the Romans. Christian freedom, he says, is more like this. A whole, healed, put together life right now with more and more of life on the way. And your lives healed and expansive in holiness. Expansive in holiness. What a totally different concept of freedom. But we need to understand what this means exactly before we can really agree to trade in our own personal Lotterio ad in whatever shape that may take 
for Paul's promise. A couple of weeks ago, I preached on the first part of this excerpt from Romans about the fancy church term justification, which we learned together really just means our okayness, our rightness with God. Not because of anything we can do on our own, but because we believe and the amazing peace and hope that comes from that knowledge. Well, it turns out there are two parts to our lives as followers of Jesus, at least two parts. There's the first bit, justification, where we encounter the love of God in a whole new way for ourselves, and we say yes to the offer, offer of faith in Christ. Sometimes that means coming to accept over time and believe the promises made on our behalf at our baptisms, or it could be a decision made as an adult. And it's an amazing thing to truly know that we are accepted just as we are by our Heavenly Father who loves us. But God doesn't just leave us there. This is where the second churchy word comes in, sanctification, or the process of transformation, of becoming holy. One commentator writes that sanctification is a free, joyful response to what God has done for us. It's not becoming self-righteous or judgmental. When we embark on this process of holiness, we don't need to worry about becoming weird or boring or that we'll, we will be asked to sell all of our stuff. But if you're thinking, well, I'm not so sure about this, you're in great company. In the third century, church patriarch Augustine of Hippo had a fabulously worldly life before he became the Saint Augustine that we know today. In fact, Augustine was a real ladies' man. And his famous line that he recounts from his book called Confessions is this, Lord, make me good, but not yet. Today, in this chapter on the Christian life, in his letter to the Romans, Paul explains that there are two kinds of freedom and two kinds of slavery. The original text uses the word slavery throughout this reading because Romans were so well acquainted with this practice. In fact, one half to two thirds of all Romans were slaves themselves. And so Paul uses this image to explain how they need to exchange one kind of slavery for another, that the Romans can know true freedom, interior freedom, despite their bondage to a slave master when they become slaves to Christ. Today, most of us in our Canadian culture will not have firsthand experience with slavery, although some will have family who have known that burden. But all of us, if we examine ourselves, will understand that the world we live in offers us a whole pantheon of false gods that we can bow down to, gods that will indeed take our freedom and enslave us. Part of sanctification, of being on a journey of holiness, means turning away from those false gods and recognizing the one true God and making that God the Lord of your whole life and not just on Sunday mornings. And Paul wants to make clear that just because we are found acceptable by God, it doesn't mean we can live our lives in exactly the same way we did before. He writes, so, since we're out from the old tyranny, does that mean we can live any old way we want? Since we're free in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. Paul is getting at the false gods, the slavery of our world, and the insidious way that can entice us. Tim Keller, the well-known Presbyterian preacher and author of the book Counterfeit Gods, puts it like this. The Bible also speaks of idols using a political metaphor. God should be our only Lord and Master, but whatever we love and trust, we also serve. Anything that becomes more important and non-negotiable to us than God becomes an enslaving idol. In this paradigm, we can locate idols by looking at our most unyielding emotions. What makes us uncontrollably angry anxious or despondent? What racks us with a guilt we can't shake? Idols control us since we feel we must have them 
or life is meaningless. Keller goes on to say that the human heart is an idol-making factory. And if you think that sounds absurd, ask yourself this question. What makes me uncontrollably anxious or despondent if it were to get taken away? Just this week, like clockwork, since I always feel I end up learning what I'm preaching in real time, I experience the power of an idol in my own life. I love to travel. I always have. And Sam and I were excited to think about taking our girls, now that they're a bit older, to some of the places that we love around the world. And I know many of you also really love to travel. Well, this COVID time has turned this travel bug into a kind of obsession for me. I'm watching Rick Steves' videos on a nightly basis, which on its own would be fine, but then I also find myself slavishly creating travel itineraries for a trip I might take in five years. I started to get very anxious when Sam said to me, you know, we have to really see how this COVID situation is gonna play out. It could be a couple of years of us staying closer to home. That sent me into a real funk. That good thing, travel, had turned into an idol. So I prayed and said, Lord, forgive me for becoming so obsessed with the future that I'm rushing past the great blessings you have for me today. And then I started just listing those things off and I was just so thankful. And I felt a kind of new freedom and peace from all that crazy list making. Real freedom comes from worshiping only the one true living God, not bowing to other idols. Paul goes on to explain another aspect of the false freedom the world offers. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had? This is one of life's great ironies. What may appear to be freedom isn't. My systematic theology professor back in seminary explained freedom to me like this. He said, I am free to go online right now and order everything I could possibly ever think of wanting off the L.L. Bean uh, website. He actually said catalog, but I thought I'd modernize it for us. And that may feel like freedom but then I have to figure out what to do with all this stuff, when I would possibly wear it, how to pay for it. I'm left with a big hangover on my credit card. Christian freedom is different. It's the lasting freedom that comes from living under grace and within boundaries. Not because I have to do that, but because I have the agency to make that choice. And that is the great gift God has given us, agency and free will so we can choose. But some choices, the selfish ones that don't come from God are a dead end, and that's what Paul says in this excerpt from Romans. While the choices God offers us lead to life in all its fullness, the abundant life. There's a freedom from certain things, freedom from government, from boring jobs, convention, or even commitment. And then there's freedom for, for love, for unity, peace, and for joy, freedom for service, the freedom that comes from the rich simplicity of being ourselves before God. But this whole process of becoming free, becoming more like Jesus is the work of a lifetime. Even Paul himself said, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. We all feel like this on our journey with God. We stumble and we fall. We had just this conversation at Alpha a couple weeks ago. Nikki Gumbel, the Alpha pioneer, told a story of how he yelled at a cab driver to move over when he was riding his bike, only to find out that the guy had signed up for an Alpha course and knew exactly who Nikki Gumbel was. Nikki told this story as a way of explaining sanctification, that we all have work to do. I can share my own story of this. 
Many of you are going on daily walks, and I'm sure none of you have had this experience and I'm about to describe. Anyway, I walk with my dog Prudence north up Mount Pleasant and into the cemetery gates. And each morning as I walk, I listen to wonderful praise music. It really allows me to worship God during this COVID time. Those walks are mostly life-giving. But sometimes there are cyclists that bike on the sidewalk and I can't move over because I'd, be, and I'd end up right on Mount Pleasant Road. And I start to get really annoyed as the cyclist is approaching because these aren't kids, they are adults wearing helmets and they could easily cycle on the street. So I've started not moving over to the side but just staying resolutely in my lane. And as the cyclist approaches, I can feel the blood start to rise. I get more and more irritated while my beautiful praise music is playing in my ears. And I will admit this to you. I have not once but twice removed my headphones and said, please go on the road in a very bossy voice. And if I had had a purse with me, I probably would have swung it at the cyclist. And these cyclists, don't say anything, but I am left steaming mad and it takes me a good 10 minutes of my walk to simmer down. And just like Nikki Gumbel said, it's in those moments I say to myself, Lord, you are not done with me yet, not even close. Sanctification. It may be a fancy word, but it's really just putting one foot in front of the other in the right direction. And when we slip up and stumble, asking for forgiveness and allowing God to pick us up, dust us off, and set us back on the path of real freedom. That Lotterio ad from the 90s was a lie. In fact, most lottery winners don't even know what to do with all their new wealth and end up squandering it anyway. Too much of that kind of false freedom isn't good for us. But the kind of freedom that Christ promises us is lasting and real. It's bounded freedom with just enough structure to keep us on the narrow path, but so expansive and open. It's unconditional love that helps us to grow into the likeness of Jesus himself, compassionate, kind, and generous. And it's that same love that gives us agency to make good and life-giving choices as we become more like the one we follow. Rejoicing with each other, sharing the good news of our faith, and being part of a wonderful family, the church. Can you imagine that kind of freedom? Amen.
Between each petition, I will say, God of love, and the response is, fill us with your hope. Let's pray. God of all creation, we thank you that you are faithful to us, even when we are not faithful to you. You know our needs even before we ask, and you hear our prayers even when it feels like no one is listening. We lift our prayers to you, God, knowing that you are our God. Lord, we pray for the world. We pray for peace. We pray for justice, for mercy, for forgiveness. We pray for love and for freedom, the love and freedom that only you can give. God, we pray for safety as things reopen, that we would be cautious and careful. God of love, fill us with your hope. We pray for the church. We pray, Lord, that your church will become more and more like you each day, that it will become more and more like Jesus. God of love, fill us with your hope. Lord, we pray for ourselves. We pray for healing for those of us who are sick. We pray for all of the people on our hearts and on our minds. And we just pray for those who are on our hearts and on our minds right now. We pray for those who can't pray for themselves. We pray for those whose prayers that only you know. We pray for all those who are lonely and isolated. God of love, fill us with your hope. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. As we all know, this pandemic has battered the economy and individuals and organizations are reeling. Your church is no different. We are still paying staff and paying for the upkeep of our building, and we also continue to do outreach. The work of the church continues even in lockdown. In this state, we're all learning to be grateful for God's blessings in the middle of uncertain times. Part of that gratitude is shown through our generosity. Even in the midst of a crisis, we know that God is good to us and will continue to meet our needs. We also know that when we give sacrificially and proportionately to the work of God in the world, the more grateful and contented we feel. Please visit our website where you may follow the link to give. All donations over $20 will receive a tax receipt. And if you're already signed up for pre-authorized giving, thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.